This video is going to stop you overthinking Aperture to allow you to lean into its creative aspect without your head getting mired in all that mathematical mumbo jumbo. How's it, how's it guys? This episode is brought to you by Frames Magazine and more about them later on. Aperture is one of the three fundamentals in the technical side of photography, along with shutter speed and ISO. They make up the exposure triangle. Now out of the three of them, Aperture has the capacity to confuse the most because it is very mathematical. There seems to be no relationship between the numbers and what's actually going on. But I've found that the easiest way to think about Aperture from a practical point of view is to think about what your own eyes do. Your eyes share a characteristic with your the lenses in your camera in so much as there is an iris that opens and closes depending on how much light that either the eye wants to let through or that you as the photographer want to let in to the sensor or the film. So when it's really bright to someone, if I look up at this light here, my irises will contract. So my pupil, and think of the pupil as the aperture, is really small to restrict the amount of light coming through. And conversely, when I'm walking around the house at night with the lights off, my pupils are open wide, so the aperture is open wide, the iris is opened, expanded to let in as much light as it possibly can so that I don't tread on that Lego that my son has left strategically in the middle of the hallway. But really the most practical way of learning about Aperture and removing all of this, you know, mystique around it is to, well, to take some photographs. And we're not going to do that sitting on the couch here, are we? So if we need to get outside. Here we are in the wonderful, glorious, summertime I was going to go outside and take some pictures of the garden and stuff but the wind is blowing like a Boeing and it's just it's too much and also Haggis wanted to come in and see what was going on so really apertures you know one of the things that people get really confused about is the fact that the larger the number the smaller the actual aperture so if this is this pot plant here that that hold if that was f 1.4 and that's f 22 of the same lens, you can sort of see why people get confused because the, the smaller number is the larger aperture and that's the, the, the bigger number and the smaller aperture. So once you kind of get your head around that, then, you know, the world is your oyster, as they say. But let's have a look, really, at taking some pictures. I'm going to throw those guys over there, right? And just, you know, put this into practice. Because this is really what this is about. It's understanding what the apertures do, apart from allowing the amount of light to pass onto the sensor. So if I get my little camera, and we're going to take some pictures. So we have here this stunt pot plant of awesomeness who's going to help us out understanding the difference between apertures and how we can use them. So using this pot plant as the example, I am going to shoot on aperture priority. Now the reason I'm shooting aperture priority is because basically I don't want to have to worry about exposures, about changing the shutter speed, any of that kind of stuff. I just want to focus on working through the apertures and keeping the same exposure. Right? This is the triangle of exposure at work that you can keep one of them constant and change the others to keep the same overall exposure. Right? So I've said it, the aperture priority at f1.8, so that's this lens's maximum aperture, that's as wide open as the, uh, the irises are gonna go, and we're gonna see what happens. Okay, so I am photographing and there we go. So we have a pot plant that is separated out from the background. You can't see any of my old pots or the, the blue barrels outside, any of that kind of stuff because I've set a very shallow depth of field. This is what happens when the, the aperture is wide open. It lets in all that light, but also the, the payback is you can only have a small amount of, of area that's distinctly recognizable. Okay, so what happens now if I close down the lens to let's say f2.8, keeping in the same place, photographing the fern, and you'll notice that the background is starting to become a little bit more distinct, that we're seeing more of these leaves in focus because that depth of field is starting to extend out from our point of focus. Now an interesting little tidbit here that may have solved a great issue with your landscape photos is that if you are trying to have everything in focus, 
that there's some sweeping mountains in the distance. And you focus on those mountains, you set your lens to f22 or f16, whatever your maximum, you know, sort of smallest aperture is going to be. Then you think, well, hang on, this is not in focus. That's because at the, the point of focus, in this case, when you were photographing those mountains, the depth of field actually extends mostly behind that point of focus, only a little bit in front. So next time you want to do that, you want to get maximum sharpness from front to back, focus a bit on something arbitrary, a bit closer to the camera, right? I know it goes against all convention, but it's true, right? So believe me. So back to our fern of awesomeness, and we're gonna to go to 5.6, okay? So this is, I'm photographing on a 50 mil lens here, and lenses also will affect how much depth of field you get. And there's another thing that affects, we'll have a look in a second. Now the background is starting to get more distinct. The, the fern is less separated out from the background. That's obviously what you know, often people do with, with um, you know, taking portrait photographs. So we're gonna go all the way up to, let's say, let's F11 right now. And I'm gonna hold it very still because my shutter speed has dropped to 13th of a second. And there, oh, you can hear that long shutter speed. But right now, it's very hard. You can start to see the trees in the background. They're all there. They're, they're starting to become more present in the image. Now, I mentioned that obviously lenses change the depth of field. Your distance to the subject does as well. Now, I'm quite close to this fern. I can give it a little tickle there. Hello. Ooh, he likes that tickle, tickle, tickle. But if I move further away from him, and I go back all the way to being wide open, right? So that's f1.4, and I'm back here by the by this. And can I take a picture? That you can see is less separated from the background, right? And if I get, oops, don't want to get close because I'm just showing a point here, right? So if I go to uh, F11, we said right at another extreme, and you'll notice from here that pretty much everything is going to be, well, I say in focus, that's a very, they're not technically in focus, they're just visually distinct. There's only one point of focus, but that's, that's a little bit technical. So most people just talk about things being in focus. During the summer, it's super nice out there on my bench where I can enjoy the view that we're very lucky to have here. Now, one of the great things is to sit there with a magazine like Frames Magazine and get inspiration not from just the, the countryside, but also from the wonderful photographers who they showcase in their magazine, also on their app and in their online community. If you'd like to save 10% on your annual subscription or a monthly subscription, easy, to Frames Magazine, then click on the link below. Please do support them just the same way that they have supported this channel over the last few months. All right, so now you can see, because uh, it's the beginning of spring, <laughs> I haven't done much planting out, but we've got some, again, some very able garlic that's struggling on, and, uh, and some um, onions, I believe, that are also trying to get themselves going. But we're gonna take some pictures of these guys, and we're gonna start off, again, wide open, so that's F1.4, and for people who are photographing Canon, that's the little AV sign if you wanna shoot on aperture priority for other cameras may be available, different sort of lenses. Look in your manual and it will tell you, right? So one of the things, you know, about that shallow depth of field, we can look at this little arrangement of, um, you know, of onions here. Go, well, they're okay, but let's see what happens if we photograph it wide open. We're gonna pick one little guy. Okay, so that little guy there at the front. Okay, now that's turned what is a fairly dull uninteresting tray of little sprouty onions into something that's vaguely interesting, right? And you can do the same up here. We've got all these little aspects of things, you know, the, the framework, and you're just having a little look-see around, finding places, isolating things out to try and just change the way that things look. One of the, the benefits of, of using you know, shallow depth of field is not necessarily just separating the subject out from the background, but showing everyday objects and things in a way that looks different. Now there's another little trick, which I was hoping to show you as a bonus trick for you, right? Is um, if you are photographing at F 
22. So that is making the lens go all the way down. If we go always to f22, and we use this completely unused button on most cameras here, which is the depth of field preview, and we'll see what happens if I get that to actually focus on it. I don't know if it will, but if we close this down, we get that button, we go like, boop, all right. Did you hear that little sound? That is me, you can see they're doing like that, stopping the lens down. So there's a little button on the side there, which will manually stop the lens down. So you can see what your depth of field is before you take the picture. Yeah, clever. Anyway, so up in there behind the clouds somewhere <laughs> is the sun. And if the sun was out, I could turn this lens to f22, you know, so that the aperture is really, 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 really tiny. And then what will happen is that when I photograph the sun, it will make starbursts. Of course, you don't want to be pointing your camera at the sun, because that would be too much, right? Because you, you, in all seriousness, do not point your camera straight at the sun if you're looking through it, because essentially you have a telescope on the end of the, and everybody knows that is not a good thing. But what will happen is where it's peeking through the trees or peeking behind a building or something like that, it will end up being a starburst. Now that will save you at least $20 <laughs> in buying a starburst filter or doing any of that kind of stuff. It also introduces a lot of flair into the, the pictures. And I'm sorry if somebody's going to take, you know, offense, it's not technically flair or something like that. But these are ways that you can be creative with apertures that go beyond just shooting wide open. If you have found this video interesting and you'd like to know more about how to use the equipment at your disposal in fun and unique ways, then check out my video about wide angle photography, which you can find right here. Thank you ever so much for watching and I will see you again soon.